refreshing. Okay, that's him. Huh? We roll back, and we had a great yontif, and um, uh, I'd like to talk about several things. One of them, how we utilize what we got from the yontif. And we will base our discussion on the Pasha of the week. <coughs> the Pasha is Pasha Snoya. But since we didn't have a chance to talk about Pasha's Bereshis, Pasha's Bereshis is a very fundamental Pasha. So I thought that I will take a little time for Pasha's Breshis, and then we'll go also to Pasha's Noyach. We spoke in the past, discussed in great detail, and the fact, you understand English? To be slack, you? A little bit. Noga. Do also a little bit. Um, we discussed this point that the whole world everything in the world was first created and the world was fully developed and then came man, Odom Orishim was created the very last in the entire creation. <coughs> and when Nick was created, God told him that this entire creation that you see, the entire world, is for you. And your job is to capture the whole world. You should be fruitful and should multiply and you should capture and take over and and uh, subdue the whole world. God told Adam. Yeah. Right there at the time, the first thing when it was created, right there in the when the Torah relates in the six days, the Torah says that God made Adam, and part of the creation of Adam was that He told him, "Be fruitful and multiply." And and um, uh, fill the earth and capture it. Like if sure, subdue it. <coughs> Since that this was stated right there at the time when he was created, not later on, <coughs> like a mitzvah, it was stated right there in Adam in the cre in the. In the, in the relation of the creation, when the Torah relates, tells us about the creation. That means that this principle, that Odom, that the world belongs to Odom, and Odom has to take it over and capture it and humanize. You know what humanize means? Transform the world into a human world rather than a beastly and animal world. That is part of the creation. This is not a secondary thing, an add-on, something extra, but this is primary. This is part of the creation. This is why the whole creation was made. So, as I said, in, in the past we discussed this and I'm in, in greater detail on what the significance of this is. I want to uh, discuss just one aspect. The Medrash says 
that <coughs> Hashem created the whole world first so that when Adam comes, he will have a world ready for him. And then he will be able to work in the world. So now, the question that I would like to attend to is, when Odin came and he saw the whole world, his, the world actually came, was before him. All the trees, all the animals, all the fish, all the fowl, everything came before him. Now, Hashem told him, oh, you should know that this is all for you. So, but he was actually the last one to come. So now he has to struggle with the whole world and tell the fish and tell the animals and say, yes, you were here before me, but I'm the boss. That's not an easy thing. He is coming, he's like intruding on, on, on their existence because they were there before him. If the world was created for an Odo, then it would seem to be more appropriate and God would first create Odo. He would be the first one. And then, <clears throat> when Odom needs a fruit, God gives him, creates a tree for him. So it's clear that the tree was created for him. Odom needs an animal. God creates an animal. So it's clear that it's for him. And that way, the whole world would automatically be subjugated to Odom. He wouldn't have to struggle with it. There has to be a significance in this Indian that the world was created first. For Adam. And for Adam. The similar question, and the similar phenomenon exists in every individual person. Because at the time when a person is born, he is born with the Nefesh Abahams, with the animal soul. He immediately appreciates the world. The godly soul first comes into him at the time of Bar Mitzvah, or even later. Depends different stages. Now, just to for clarification purposes, the godly soul is with him all the time from birth, but it doesn't reveal itself until his intellect develops, until he ban mitzvah. Up until that time, he's not responsible for his deeds, and that and the godly soul is not really functioning yet fully, but he is functioning with the animal soul. So we have the similar situation. <coughs> His godly soul, his nefesh olikis, has a task to direct and to capture the whole person. And the animal soul says, who are you? Why are you coming to me to intrude on my, on my property? I'm here first. And not only is this kind of a debate between the nefesh olikis and nefesh abam is who owns the property, but actually, that makes it much more difficult, because by the time he's by mitzvah, he is used to participating and 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 um, um, benefiting and enjoying the world. And now he has to start learning a new thing, and and changing everything. So it's a challenge. It's a new struggle. So we have the same question. <coughs> if the purpose of the, of the person here is the nefesh olikis, is the godly soul, to reveal godliness in the world, so that should be first. If he needs the, the animal soul in order to feed his body, that let it come later. So that we could see that the animal soul is there to serve the godly soul. What is the general explanation of this? The general explanation is 
that if in fact God would have created Adam first and everything else would come later, then everything that came would not be a complete entity unto itself. He would be pre-owned by Odom. The animal would not be a full-fledged animal unto itself. Like we discussed the other time when we, when, when we went into this deeper, we said that a tree grows and produces fruit, but as far as the tree is concerned, it's not interested in the fruit. It's just doing its own thing. The fact that it's fruit and you can eat it, that's because God gave the, 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 the tree to Adam. But the tree on its own is not interested in that. The tree on its own is, is a full-fledged entity unto itself. And so to everything, the, 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 um, the animals and everything, is a, they're totally independent entities. And Odom comes and he explains to them what they are here, what they were made for. So that if the world would have been created in different order, where Adam would come first and everything would come to him, then everything that was created in the world would have been what's called a qualified presence, and a limited existence. Because it doesn't exist for itself, it exists to begin with to serve Adam. It has a, a limited, a limited power. So God created everything first, so that everything that exists has unlimited power, is a complete entity unto itself. And then Adam comes, and he takes this, and he subdues it, and he makes it to be a ser of service to, to Hashem. We will discuss in a moment the, the value and the benefit of this, just to diverge a little bit. Understanding this phenomenon, which is true in the general world, and it's true <coughs> in every individual person. The Nefesh Abahamis came first, and Nefesh Abahamis is a, is a whole Nefesh, really, and he can pursue a whole life with the Nefesh Abahamis. This explains the fact that for Odom and for every human being, for every Yid, to accomplish his task in the world does not come easy. It's not something that comes automatic. He has to struggle. He has to fight with himself. He has to overcome his own tendencies, and he has to overcome the 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 camouflage, the misrepresentation, or, the, or rather the presentation of the world presents to him. When he goes out into the world, what does he see? He sees a world running on its own, a natural world. Where is God? What are you talking about? And he gets all flustered. And what flustered means? He becomes in spoil. He says, yeah, what am I, I'm, I'm, I'm denying the existence of the world. I'm saying God's created. No, but it's, it's really very powerful. And he has to overcome this. And it's a struggle. It's a personal struggle within himself. And it's a struggle with the world itself, with the world. Because there is resistance. And the resistance is what's called justified, because really it's, it's a whole entity. It's contradictory to, to what you believe in anything. Right. And this is why we are taught in the Torah. This is the unique Indian in the Torah, and the power of the Torah, that the Torah instructs us and gives us 
the means by which we can take an object in the world which is really an entity complete a complete entity unto itself so to speak disinterested in anything but itself we take this object we utilize we subdue it and we and we and we utilize it entirely for a godly purpose but we don't destroy it we don't destroy the world in other words, this conflict between godliness and the world is a conflict that if not for the Torah, the only way the only way it could be handled is by one destroying the other. And the Torah gives us the means and the guide and the and the koyach, how we can both cap- capture the world and conquer the world without destroying it. On the contrary, by building it. Without the Torah, no matter how wise a person is, he would not be able to do this. This is what it says that that before the Torah was given, the great man of the period, Yankev Ovinu, Avram, Yankev, Yitzhak, Yankev, and even before them, Shem and Nebuchadnezzar, if you will learn in Mitzvah Shem, they learned Torah. Even Rashi brings it, says in the Pasha today, that Lomad Noyach Torah. Did you come across that? And Hashem told Noyach they should take from the clean animals seven, from the unclean animals they should say take two, <laughs> two <laughs> pairs. <laughs> right. So it says that you should take from the clean animals. What's a clean animal? Kosher. Kosher. How does Noyach know anything about kosher? It's on the Torah. on the Torah. That means that Noyach learned to it. <coughs> so Noyach also learned to it. But all of that learning of Torah was because, because Noyach was a very wise and smart man. He had great insight and he was able to learn the, 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 the way the Indian is above. And the same thing Avram, Yitzhak, and Yankiv. They also learned Torah. Not only they learned Torah, but they also kept the mitzvahs. But the mitzvahs that they did is not the same as the mitzvahs that we do. Our mitzvahs, when we take a, a, a physical article, like we may we take the straps, the film straps, or maybe we may take parchment and we write a parch of film, it becomes holy. The whole, the, the physical article itself, even though it comes from a behemoth, which doesn't know anything about God, and we can take it and make it holy. That's the power of the Torah. Without that power, Avram didn't have that power. He can do everything, but he can do everything, what's called Baruchnis, spiritually. But physically, to affect the world, he wasn't able to do. Not Avram, not Yitzhak, not Yankim, not Ishmael, no one. So that this whole order of the creation that the world was created first and Adam came last and the same thing the creation of the human being that the Nefesh Abam is precise and Nefesh Abam tells us that the job of the Nefesh, the job of the Yid and the job of Nefesh Abam is, is not just a smooth thing that you should do what you feel like but it's a, it's a struggle that has to be that obstacles have to be overcome and it's a struggle that requires transformation, changing the world, not just using it the way it is, but changing it. And very briefly, this, the purpose of this struggle is 
that thereby, as a result of this struggle, what we are accomplishing, what we are bringing down, what we are revealing ultimately in the world is something that is really in itself much higher than the world. Because within, this, within the confines of the world, we couldn't accomplish it. So this is a lengthy discussion in Hasidus, what it is that Torah accomplishes and so forth. Maybe over the time when we come to Matan Torah, we'll discuss it. Just wanted to give us an insight and understand the, the order of the creation. If, if it was created for Odom, how come it's so, there's such a struggle? How come when we want to do a good thing, we have such a struggle? Nothing comes easy. We want to slip and go right into the world, it fits right in. Everything comes easy. When we want to do something that is godly, that really is, is a human uh, oblig obligation, Everything is in the struggle. You have to struggle with yourself and struggle with the world. This was intentionally created like this from the beginning. So when you come and you see that you have a struggle and things don't come easy, you have to overcome personal, personal obstacles and external obstacles. Don't get disappointed. This is how it was intended. It's not you. It's not your fault. It's not because of your shortcoming. This is the way God made the world to begin with. <coughs> but we have to remember that he gave each one of us the, the power, the strength. He gave Odom Orishi. He relinquished, he relinquished, he gave over the world to Odom. And because of this power that Hashem gave the world to Odom, ultimately Odom prevails and he will be victorious and he transforms the world into a godly world. And each one of us, through our struggle, ultimately will prevail over our animals <coughs> and prevail over our little world. But we have to know that it has to, that it requires hard work. But this hard work pays off. Because that's what the whole creation is all about. It means going against the grain. <coughs> right. With the grain, but again. Right. The important thing that I'm trying to, that I want to, to impress upon you is that when things come difficult, we get disappointed and we feel that we're wasting our time. Why should I waste, spend so much time on learning this piece and learning this piece? I can go and learn mathematics and, and everything will just flow right into my head. And here I'm struggling with one line or with two lines and with a page. It seems, seems like a waste of time. So you should understand that in the accomplishment of understanding any little bit of Torah, learning a little bit of Torah, or learning a little bit of Chassidus, or Davening, whatever it is, is infinitely more powerful more effective and fulfilling the purpose of your being in this world much more than anything else you can do. This is the real struggle of life. I want to now jump over to Pasha Snoyach. And uh, <clears throat> In the Pasha Snoyach, we have the flood. Everybody knows the flood. Hashem brought a flood, and he flooded the whole world. At least the, the 
populated world of the time, and everything was wiped off, everything was destroyed, except Noyach and his family remained, and, and the select animals remained in this table, remained in this box. And from this was created a new world. <clears throat> there is a, a uh, saying from the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov says, the poet Hashem said to Noyach, Boy al table, enter the ark, enter the box. Mm-hmm. So the Baal Shem Tov said, that the word teva also means the word. Boy, teva means enter the word, the word of Torah and the word of tefillah. Mm. What is the correlationship? It seems like a play on the word. What is the relationship between the teva, the ark of Maya, the box, and teva, the word, you know, the word of Torah? Table means also a word, the word of Torah and the word of Tefillah. What's the correlation? Kashik said it, but I don't, I don't remember. No, Rashi doesn't talk about this. This is from Baal Shem Tov. What is this Boyala Teva? What's the correlation between these two? <coughs> so, if we think about the flood, the flood is an interesting thing. The world was flooded with water. What's water? Water. Huh? Water. Right, but the first thing that comes to mind is this. Water really is an life's necessity. A person cannot live without water. Water is is a necessity of life. A person must have water every day. Even more important than food. And yet <coughs> somehow when the water is not administered the right way, then it becomes a flood and it destroys everything. How do we understand this? How do we put it in perspective? I mean, we can see factually that this is how it happens. But what, what's the teaching? What is the perspective of this? Yeah, what, what does this mean? Now, water, on the one hand, is such a life and such a wonderful thing. And without, and, and then it becomes a flood. If you overdo it, it, it spoils everything. You have to... Right, right. How do we understand? What's the perspective? How do we understand it, you know, precisely? And I want to um, incorporate into this discussion your experience of this month of the Yom Tevi, of the month of Tishrei, especially the 770 experience, the Crown Heights experience. It's like a flood of of a, a, a flood of experience, <coughs> a flood of dancing, a flood of singing, a flood of davening. So we see from from the flood of Noyach that 
there, that there is a, a correct way to utilize a flood, and there is one that is that does not bring any benefit and could be actually um, could be detrimental. How did Noyak survive the flood? Noyak survived the flood because he had a box. <coughs> he had a table. Just as when we want to take water, how do we drink water? We take a cup and we drink water. We don't submerge ourselves into the water to drink it. If we submerge into the water, it's not going to work. We have to take it out of the water. But we take the same water. But we have to take it out, put it into a cup, make a bracha, and then drink it. What this means is that every great and overwhelming experience that a person has, particularly now that we're coming from Tishrei, it was a great and overwhelming experience. If we just relate to it in that in that totality, in the way it is overwhelming, the way it is great, then we are not really taking anything of it inside. It's a good experience. It was about experience. The expression is it was good as long as it lasted. Now, okay, what's what's next? What we have to do is we have to, like the Baal Shem Tov says, we have to take words of Torah and words of Tefillah, and we have to allow that this flood of 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 simcha. And this flood of of, um, of celebration and, and elevation should give us the encouragement and the strength to delve into the words. But ultimately, we can't remain with the flood because then we have nothing. So this is the, the, the point which I want to elaborate on. We are starting a new year. Bar Hashem, we started, we started with a great thunder, with a tremendous experience. But that experience has to be now um, utilized practically. It has to give us the inspiration and the strength for everything that we need to do. And we have to, again, the similar thing that we spoke about before. If you learn a Pasha Chumash, and you know one word of the Pasha, This is like taking a cup of water and drinking it. And that's when it gives you strength and it gives you life. And if you are just excited about it and you're dancing with the Torah, but you don't take it inside, then it doesn't, there, there, there is no no highest comes in. Then there's beautiful water, fresh spring water, and it doesn't enter inside. Nothing happens. In the long run, nothing happens. So, it could be that one would feel it is almost like 
anticlimactic. You know what anticlimactic? The big climax, you know, excitement. And now all of a sudden you have to sit down and start struggling with the words. So you kind of feel, oh, it's a down, it's a downfall. So we have to understand that far from being a downfall, This is the only way to utilize and to capture all that great experience that you had in Tishri. The resolve and the inspiration that we have from Tishri is an expression that the Friedrich Rebbe says that after Tishri you come home and he says, it's now time to, to open the package. You know, in Tisha, you, you pack everything up into your pockets. Now you have to start emptying the pockets and see, what did, you, what did I bring along? What did I, what did I get from it? This is real work, just like we said before that right in the beginning of creation, Hashem had immediately directed and told Adam, this is going to be a struggle, and you have to capture the world. And each one of us has to capture his own obstacles. And as I said, it is important to know that when you learn inside a word of Torah, you have to learn it and repeat it and repeat it until it sticks in your brain. Until you know it. I said, this is the real chayas. This is how you take water from the big flood and you feed yourself and feed your soul and you feel, and you feed your, 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 and gives you strength. If it takes a struggle, it takes to overcome the, the excitement of Nafesh Oh, just a moment ago, we were so excited. That's true. But you have to utilize that excitement. How do you utilize it? About the parasha, please. About what? What we're discussing or something different? Something in the beginning I didn't understand. When Noach is a tzaddik, and God told him he's going to bring him a bull, and Noach not so believed. He's doing what God tells him, but he's not believed. So all the time he's a tzaddik. He's getting outside till he feels the, 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 the rain go, going up. And then he's getting inside to the ship. Well, this is what we, exactly what we are saying. That the world is still a world, and one cannot believe that, that this big world can be destroyed. It's just too big. Immediately after, immediately after the flood, Noach came out of the ark. Hashem told him to come out and take everybody out. And Noach brought a korban. And as a result of this korban, God made a covenant with Noach. And what was this covenant, a breeze? The covenant was that the 
the world, the natural world, the seasons of the world will never, day and night and all this, the seasons will never cease, will never be interrupted. Um, this gives us again an understanding of what is going on in the natural world. Because when you look at the world and everything seems to be just building on itself, a natural process that maintains the world, it would appear to be that this natural process is what actually keeps the world going. I once mentioned to you that um, one time the Rebbe was asked, um, this is going back in the early years of the nuclear development, someone asked the Rebbe whether he thought that there could be a nuclear war. In the time of the, in the early 60s, when there was a big conflict, a big competition between the United States and, and the Soviet Union, they were each building up their arsenals, nuclear arsenals. So the, um, but the world was, was scared. What's going to be? So someone asked the Rebbe, but it's conceivable that people will, that will use these arsenals in war. There will be a nuclear war. And the Rebbe answered that we can never predict the future. But we, know, we cannot rule it out. We can't rule it out that it's impossible that it could be such a nuclear war. Because we saw from history that every weapon that people developed, they ultimately used. And if we reflect on the type of weapons, type of warfare that people did 3,000 years ago, when they, when they fought with stones, with rocks, and then when we, when we fight with, with airplanes throwing bombs down, we know that it's, it, it's wild. Somebody from, that, that from 3,000 years ago would see an airplane throwing down fire, he would say, the world is coming to an end. <laughs> right? It's, it's crazy. It's crazy. Anyways, what I said, people developed wild uh, weapons, and all weapons that people developed, they ultimately used. And therefore, you can rule out the possibility of them using nuclear weapons. So then this person has the Rebbe. So then in that case, the world will be destroyed. And the Rebbe said, that is not possible. The world cannot be destroyed. Why? That's not, there's no logic to it. Clearly, there is enough weaponry, firepower in the world, nuclear power, to destroy everything out. What guarantees that the world will not be destroyed? What guarantees it is the what? The the because right, because Hashem wants it to be. God wants it to be, and this is why it cannot be destroyed. Okay, now this is, you know, a nice thought, in a, so to speak, in a far-fetched situation. But in fact, what this is telling us is something that really affects us directly and is very real in our own lives. Because when we look at the world, and as I said before, God created a complete world. In the six days of creation, a complete world, a real world. That is, everything in the world is independent of everything else.
the depth and the reality, and the power of the world is such that it is clear that this world exists not merely a natural force, but that there is something higher than the world itself that maintains it and gives it sustenance. In other words, the godly presence in the world, even though we don't see it, we see it through the world. But the very fact that the world is, is such a reality, and it's inconceivable that it can be destroyed, clearly states that there is a godly force in it. It's not just <clears throat> a physical world, because the physical world can fall apart. And we should be able to conceptualize and think, oh, yeah, it'll go and come, come apart. But we could see, and the Torah teaches us, we should know, that the basis of the world is much greater than what meets the eye. It isn't the physical world that maintains itself, but there is a godly will that maintains in, in the world. To translate this, this is the important thing, to translate this to us, every individual. God made a covenant with the general world, but this covenant actually extends itself to every individual. Every one of us has to reflect and understand and when we, when we reflect upon our own story of life and our own Ashgoha Protis, we will readily see it that our lives cannot be explained according to natural rule law, laws, according to natural rules. Everyone, every individual person, every individual eat knows deep down clearly that his presence in his life is clearly blessed by a force by the Mabishna himself. He is the one who watches over us. He's the one who guarantees our being in this world, who guarantees our success when we put the effort in. It's not that we are left alone, Hasbashal. Every individual person is an indestructible entity. You say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm just a weakling, I'm just a little person. You are just a little person, but who wants you be here? God himself wants you here. And that makes you infinite. That makes you all powerful. Makes you all capable. Whatever it is that we have to accomplish, whatever it is that we need to know and to do, we have all the strength that Hashem Himself makes sure that we have it. We have the blessing from Hashem, we have the, we have the support. All we have to do and we have to utilize the blessing that Hashem gives us and bring it down, and like I said, take the cup and drink water. The water is all there, but take the cup and drink it. And it's an amazing thing. A person can be dry and thirsty, and really losing it. He takes a little sip, and it comes to life. The same thing is in our spiritual life. We all, you know, some of us started here in adult age and all that, and we start late. Any little bit that we learn, in real learning, that we really absorb and we really know it and we really struggle to put it into our brains that we should know the, the, the word, its meaning and its translation and, and its context, that is a source of life. This is what sustains us. And Hashem gives us the strength to do it. We just have to overcome 
the Nefesh Abahamis, that says, oh, I'm lazy. It's not interesting. It's not interesting. To watch the flood is more interesting than to drink a cup of water. But nobody wants to experience a flood. They want to, want to have a, a measured cup of water. So, coming back from the month of Tishrei and having gone through the Pasha of Breshis and now we're in Pasha Snoyach, just want to tell you, these Pashiyas are so rich <coughs> if we can get the feel of, of um, the Homish Breshis in general, and particularly Pasha's Breshis, Noyach, Lech Lechor, they are so rich in terms of us giving the feel and the sense of Hashem's direct intervention, direct presence in the world. everything. This is the reality. This is our own reality. This is not something that happened five and a half thousand years ago. This is our own reality. Like the famous episode with the Alter Rebbe. Am I referring to? You're shaking your head. The Alter Rebbe, when the Alter Rebbe was imprisoned, and a minister came to see him, to talk to him. And <coughs> to this minister asked the Alter Rebbe, it says in the Bible, it says in the Torah, these were, they were very, very highly educated people who, who were involved with the Alter Rebbe's interrogation. It says in the Torah that God called Odom, and he said to him, where are you? Ayeko. After, the, after he ate from his Adas. God called Odom and says, Ayeko, where are you? What does it mean? What's it, what, what's it mean? God called Odom and asked him, where are you? <coughs> so the altar Rebbe said to him, What it means is that God calls every person all the time and he asks him, Ayeko, where are you in the process of fulfilling your mission on this earth? And then the Alter Rebbe actually said to this minister, he, he named his age, he says, you're 56 years old, I think that was... 53? 53? Yeah, that's what the... You know, 53 years old. And God is asking you, what are you, what have you accomplished in terms of fulfilling your mission on this earth? In other words, what I'm pointing out is that what's, this interaction, this very close interaction that is related in Pasha's Breshis, Noyach, Lech Lecha, and so forth, and the whole Chumash, Chumash branches, that pertains to every one of us. It's real. And it applies to everyone. How, how does a person find out his mission on the earth? How does, how does he find that? You're going to know when you find it. <laughs> Seriously, the mission, know. the mission on earth, the mission on earth is defined by a person's faculties, his capabilities, and his opportunities. Once the mission is accomplished, then the person dies. The mission, the person has the years which allow him to fulfill his mission. They go together. The point which I wanted to, yeah, this is a separate segment to understand that 
these, that when we learn Torah, this is not a historical occurrence. This applies to everyone. And it's real to everyone. And, and just as in Pasha Bereshis, it's clear how God sustains everything and every individual thing. Odom, Kai, and Hevel, the whole operation. That applies to every individual person. And Hashem made a covenant with Noyach. This covenant pertains to every one individual. So we can stop worrying about what's going to be tomorrow. Am I, is, is, is the world going to come to an end? Or my world going to come to an end? Nothing like this is going to happen. Just know what you have to do and go with full confidence in doing it. You don't have to worry about, look behind you, what's going behind you, what's going behind you. Nothing, just concentrate on what you have to do. Put your, your head and soul into what you have to do, 100%, and everything else, and you'll be secured by God's covenant with you individually and help you to fulfill your mission and to do your thing. And it's important to remember the very first thing that I said, that we said over here today, there is going to be a struggle. Without struggle, nothing happens. Without struggle, nothing happens. Anything in Kedusha, anything in holiness, requires hard work. Because there's going to be opposition. If it comes very easy, beware. Maybe you're going in the wrong direction. <laughs> Isn't the, isn't the right way, couldn't, couldn't that also be easy also? Because, I mean, God guides our steps. He so, I mean, yeah, guides our steps, but, but we have to take the steps. Yeah. And taking the step is, a, is in really a struggle. So, we are starting a new year, so to speak, with a the, with the, <coughs> with the firm step, with the right foot, and we have to, we have Hashem's help, put everything we got, take that flood of, of, of wonders of Kishrei and take it piecemeal and put it into the words of the Torah, into the words of Davni, and get to actually sink in, drink it, know it. If it takes a hundred times to learn it until you know it, do that. You'll never regret that. You don't have much time to repeat other times. No. You're right. You're right. Whatever time you have. But don't be afraid that I'm wasting all my time. This is boring. I'm accomplishing nothing. That's not the case. That's not the case. You're accomplishing enormous things. And you should know one important factor in terms of it generally in a person's learning. When a person struggles in learning one word and he finally gets it into his brain, the next word will be much easier. It's not a repeat of what he did before. It's a breakthrough. Everything it does is a breakthrough. The next one is going to be easier. The next one is going to be even easier. So, you have whatever opportunity we have, whatever time we have, whatever span of how much ever long we are in the yeshiva is also limited. Utilize it. Utilize it with, with a full dedication. And do exactly what you're told and you'll be much, much easier. Now we have to translate it for you. No? Most people have a translator. You have a translator. They got Yossi, they got Mordechai, they got Thai, they got Amra. They got a few translators. Forgive me if my question is fine. What? I'm learning every day, Chumash. Let's say today it's Shlishi. 
But I need to learn, you think I need to learn today everything by my heart, to know about that, that I can remember the Psukim and the Rashi. You don't have to learn it by a You don't have to learn it by a But, see, I don't know exactly what you learn with me. But, learning means that you know what it says. You know the words, and you can understand the content, and then ask you the same thing. Whatever your level, whatever your level, it has to be known, not fool yourself. That's the important thing. Not misjudge yourself. Oh, I, I said the words. I know generally what it means. No, that's not good. You have to know. In Rashi, there is not an extra word. So things have to fit. And if you don't have the time to finish, you know, whatever you do, do one person every day, right? And that would be a tremendous thing. Thank you. Okay. That's Locha. Thank you very much. Ready? Let's do it again. Yeah. Do it.